All I want from you is an answer. It doesn't matter who I am. I'm here for you, James. See? I'm real. Before I begin, normally the idea of discussing spoilers 20 years after a game has released is regarded as a bit of a moot point. In this case, however, we are far enough removed from the original game that many of the people that are in the market for Silent Hill 2 Remake have never played the original and would be going in fresh. This is a video where I basically crap all over the trailer for the remake that was released a year ago and go into very story heavy elements that inform my opinion. If you've not played the original game and somehow are unaware of the story, please stop watching this and go and play the original game. If, on the other hand, you are one of the following two types of people, you are already horrified by what we've seen so far of Silent Hill 2 Remake and you have come here looking for solidarity, or you know Silent Hill 2 quite well and are cautiously optimistic about the remake at present but then perhaps watch this video through and think, Shit, yeah, this is bad. Please, if you belong to either of those groups of people, do your best to convince anyone new to just go and play the original for themselves as soon as possible, but without the spoilers that I have to highlight here. This video is in two sections. Context first, and then a nice YouTube-friendly list in the second half. When Konami announced that their online event that subsequently took place in October 2022 was happening, I was taken aback for several reasons. Whilst there were murmurings of supposed activity, the confirmation that it was happening still felt very sudden. I was praying that any rumours of Luba Team's potential involvement in a remake of Silent Hill 2 were not accurate. I couldn't understand how Silent Hill was apparently coming back after all of this time, or why Konami thought that they had the right people in place to handle it. Sadly, I had correctly surmised that A, Konami were envious of the continued successful revamping of Resident Evil throughout the years, and that B, unfortunately they were just looking to cash in on the IP regardless of how delicately it needed to be handled. They've gone straight for Silent Hill 2 because it's the most highly revered, the most popular, whereas Capcom have at least tried to approach the Resident Evil remakes with a mixture of necessity meets chronology. Many of us, whether we're for or against the Silent Hill 2 remake, have wondered why the hell they didn't tackle the first game instead. It's in much dire need of a remake than Silent Hill 2 is, and the original game's story is far more mainstream and basic that you aren't going to step on the toes of the people that consistently argue that Silent Hill 2 story is at the apex of video game storylines. Which it is. I honestly watched this event hoping that Silent Hill 2 remake was not going to be there. Then I watched the event. I was left so depressed by this announcement trailer that I didn't even bother watching the rest of the Silent Hill event that evening. I have never seen the trailers for the other Silent Hill properties that they announced that night. I've seen bits of one set in Japan in the 60s or whatever it is because if you're on YouTube you'll see shit eventually. Silent Hill Ascension. I know the name and I've seen the odd thumbnail but I have no fucking idea what that is and I just don't care. It's a choose your own adventure kind of thing or something. I don't know. I didn't watch the trailer because I just do not care. Not long afterwards I made a pilgrimage to the real Toluca Lake, Keswick Water, where they took the image that they used for reference in the actual game. Yearning to unfuck my absolute dejection over the announcement and get closer to the original game again to enter the same kind of fugue state as James and rewind to a time where I didn't know the remake was a thing. In this video I will be talking about nine red flags present in the Silent Hill 2 remake trailer. If you're one of the many people who are unreservedly excited about the remake of Silent Hill 2, you probably fall into one of two categories. You've either a. Never played or watched the original and thus don't have grounds for complaint because you don't have the context, you're just excited about a new game. Or b. You have played or watched the original, but you view Silent Hill 2 as a typical horror video game experience, a spooky town, dealing with monsters and really weird shit, and the story is what it is. It's a basic framework to justify the weird horror video game, and it's not that important to you. Either way, that's fine. 
but as someone who has lived with the history of what Silent Hill 2 is for the past two decades and one who looks at the overall experience on a deeper level, I need to contextualise how I'm feeling for the people that feel the same way. Or for the people who are open to being told why this project isn't a good thing and that the evidence is in fact there already. To call this a mishandling is an understatement. There have been several critical videos made on YouTube to date, though I find that the tone of much of this disapproval is just far too forgiving, or isn't picking up on many of the bad omens that are present in the reveal. I don't have the same optimism about the project as most people do, given what I've seen so far. Most of the criticism up to this point has been aimed towards Bloober Team on the basis of their developmental history. Which I agree with, but I couldn't say that I was overqualified to comment on it. As many of us are already aware, there have been some very good and far less forgiving videos about how miserably Bloober Team handled the story of the medium, in particular from YouTuber Murd KK, as well as others. I would stress that you also watch those videos to understand that entire angle to this situation. Still, the medium is a game which I myself haven't played, so I'd rather that you watched other videos about the subject than listen to me try to talk about the medium's problems. Until I do play it myself, which I will, but it'll be for all of the wrong reasons at this point. Other people have written much better essays dissecting the medium, whereas I've just read their cliff notes. In fact, of Bloober Team's entire back catalogue, I have only played the original release of Layers of Fear. Which, admittedly, I liked more than most people, because I accepted it for what it was at the time. Did my negative expectations assist my experience? Possibly, though I appreciated the setting and subject matter in spite of the lacking gameplay. That said, I firmly believe that the best horror games are combat-focused games. and in general, Layers of Fear is not what I want from a horror game. Still, on the basis of that game alone, I personally would not have given that same studio control over a remake of Silent Hill 2. Even if I was okay with Layers of Fear, Silent Hill 2 is an entirely different beast. Now, most of the criticism in these recommended essays is based on the educated supposition that if Bloober Team handled the medium's more sensitive subject matter so poorly that they'll be equally as deft with Silent Hill 2's, particularly Angela's subplot. I can absolutely understand these arguments, but at the same time, I'm not comfortable talking about how Bloober Team will inevitably foul up Silent Hill 2's more sensitive subject matter, even if it seems likely that they will, based on the evidence of their other games, because we technically haven't seen it yet. We don't have much to go on at the moment to inform us about how they'll handle these more sensitive elements. I cannot hand on heart, say that Bloober Team couldn't somehow turn it around and handle Angela's story with the required amount of consideration, even if the medium was really bad. Instead, I will be basing my criticisms here on what I have seen from the actual game thus far, what I saw 12 months ago. That way, there can be no excuses made about how I'm judging elements of the game before I've seen them. That this game is being made by Bloober Team isn't really the crux of my argument. It's based purely on what I've seen in the trailer compared to the original game, and if this exact same reveal trailer had been handled by Capcom or some other major developer, I'd be equally worried because the evidence is in the trailer. Is that evidence there because it's being made by Bloober Team? Probably, but then for comparison's sake, there are elements of the good Resident Evil remakes that even Capcom got massively wrong. Still, I'd rather base my criticisms of Silent Hill 2 Remake based on what I have seen so far of Silent Hill 2 Remake. So, with that said, I find an overwhelming amount of evidence in the one solitary trailer that we have seen of the actual game that this project will miss the mark widely, and thus my criticisms will be based solely on that. I'm sure that hearing this will give people pause for thought, because it's just one trailer and people are going to be accusing me of jumping the gun, but the truth is that anyone with a good enough eye should have caught these problems. I pretty much caught all of it live the first time I watched it, a year ago, and it's time for me to exorcise my demons. I've been sitting on this feeling of not making an argument, of not opening people's eyes to what's wrong with this game. I've had this script written in my head for a year now. This has all been exacerbated by certain kinds of social media accounts, 
across various platforms that regurgitate optimistic, baseless PR from the developers and publishers themselves that give an everything's going great, thumbs up emoji, useless fucking update. The majority of people eat this up because they don't care. It's good news. They just want their AAA shiny game on their system of choice. Whatever you do, don't ruin their vibe with your knowledge and evidence and logic and shit. They just want to hear that everything's progressing well. No questions asked. This is one major problem with the gaming discourse, the inability for people to hear criticism about something that they like or are anticipating, something that is in production. Even when you're telling the truth and you have the experience. Personally, I'd rather we use constructive criticism to try and prevent future mistakes. If there's one thing that I can't stand, it's the ostrich defense of burying your head in the sand and pretending that everything will be fine, just because you are looking forward to something. Bloober team came out and said that the development of Silent Hill 2 Remake is going well. No shit. I'd like to bring attention to the fact that most recently I saw some of these said channels parroting one of Bloober Team's latest PR interviews, as far as I'm aware, with one quote in particular raising my eyebrows. I will paraphrase the quote here because I believe that even the tweet which I read myself was paraphrasing the quote. So this isn't verbatim. We are striving not to miss the point. Yeah, you're going to hear a lot of that in the second half of this video. Now, I reconcile the fact that most of these people likely don't even really care about Silent Hill 2's finer details beyond that it's a horror game with a spooky, foggy town where you bash sexy nurses over the head with lead pipes, get freaked out by the odd creepy noise, and the more pedestrian among us have plentiful opportunities to be weirded out by how strange this all is. Like most people dabbling in Halloween once a year. Put it on YouTube, react to get some views. A horror game is a cinema ticket to the wider demographic. It's a one and done, they'll play it to say they have done. Many people are excited about this remake because they've never played Silent Hill 2, and the reality is that many of these people either were too young or weren't yet born when the original was released. That's fine, but I have to say my piece as someone that was around at the time. One more thing that I'd also like to add before I start this list is that this is not coming from a place of nostalgia or resistance to change. I am fine with the idea of Silent Hill 2 being remade, you know, on paper, by the right people who understand it. Hell, I seem to understand Silent Hill 2 better than some, and I would personally turn down the offer, even if I had the technical expertise to develop it, because some properties are better than your own meagre love for them. I respect the original too much to touch it. Personally, I would leave it the fuck alone. The most crucial people from Team Silent are not involved in this project. Yeah, Ito and Yamaoka are there. But they aren't the really crucial people as far as I'm concerned, evidently. The problem is that a flashy trailer for a big name product with updated graphics doesn't mean anything. A big name coming back after 20 years doesn't mean anything, whether you played it originally or not. A remake still has to be a good remake. That a big game is simply being remade isn't good enough in of itself, and let's be real, the reveal trailer for Resident Evil 3 Remake had far less obvious red flags than those that I'm about to detail in this one, and look how that game turned out. I'd also add that handling a remake of something like Resident Evil 3 is a far less fragile process than handling something like Silent Hill 2 is, and Capcom's direction still managed to smash Resident Evil 3 to pieces. And yes, you should blame Capcom, not the studio to whom they outsourced that job. Capcom themselves still directed the project and had the final say. Resident Evil 3 Remake is on them. Overall, it doesn't bode well for Silent Hill 2 Remake. You can even have good remakes be good games, but yet still terrible remakes of the original. RE4 Remake has flashes of this, where what they've done in one section is a fantastic experience in a vacuum in 2023, but which pales in comparison to the original sequence it is replacing from 2004, particularly in the forms of cutscenes and dialogue. At this point, I must point out that the reason Silent Hill 2 worked in the first place was because of its storyline, which has to be presented in the same way in a remake. Silent Hill 2 is not the kind of game where you can update the graphics, modernise the combat mechanics, the gore effects, the inventory system, etc. and just expect it to land. It's also not the kind of game where you can go through it removing the no thanks bros because the storyline is actually crucial to the experience, unlike Resident Evil 4's. You cannot do some cute twist on a prior plot detail and change our understanding of it. The storyline needs to land exactly the same way it did in 2001 for this to even work. The signs so far are not positive and I'll talk about this in detail with red flag number two. Whilst everybody seems to have rather hastily forgotten the community-wide fuck Konami movement, 
too eager to get back with the problematic ex, they also seem to be viewing this as some sort of redemption arc. No, this is still Konami. I know we've all just gotten used to the knife being in the cavity at this point, and I am sorry to remind you about it, but greenlighting a shitty remake of Silent Hill 2, giving it to a studio that made anyone that knew recoil in horror when they heard the news, is the final twist of that old knife. Redemption arc? A shitty remake of Silent Hill 2 is the worst thing Konami could have ever done. The best part is that they just waited long enough for you to get over your umbrage. Like they retreated to fucking Mordor for a decade before they performed their coup de gras. Now I read that they've released the new ganked Metal Gear collection, removing Kojima's name from the new credit sequences. They haven't changed. It's time to talk about the trailer. Nothing that I'm about to say is invented fanfiction or headcanon because because I noticed that that seemed to be a common rebuttal used by the tiresome optimists that are rallying to Silent Hill 2 Remake's defence, just because it's being remade and not because they have any evidence that it's actually going to be good. No, everything that I'm about to say is based on the objective design of how the original game was presented. I'm not here whining because they're changing it, I'm here ranting because they're getting it massively fucking wrong. Final warning, if you don't want someone to shit on your anticipated good vibes, I suggest you leave now. Though, why anyone that knows anything about Silent Hill 2 would be expecting good vibes from it should the remake turn out to even be accurate is beyond me. Silent Hill 2 is a game that people play to feel depressed, and you're complaining in social media posts that people being critical of what they've seen so far that are cautiously pessimistic about Bloober Team's involvement, you're complaining that this is dampening your fucking mood. D do you even know what game this is? So, without further ado, here are the nine red flags of the reveal trailer. Red flag number one. Shit where it doesn't belong. Have you ever had one of those moments where you recognise immediately how something is about to unfold in a terrible way? You see exactly what is about to happen, you know exactly what it is that they're about to do before it has even happened. Well, that was the depressing reality of the trailer's opening second. Yes, we were one second in and I knew exactly what was happening. We were being shown a remake of Silent Hill 2's opening bathroom, but not before a cute fucking PT reference. Do all of you people remember that last Silent Hill thing you really loved eight years ago? I knew that they were chasing the zeitgeist, the internet hype bullshit as soon as I saw it. They were throwing a red herring in the opening just so that we didn't know which game the trailer was actually advertising for all of one second. Worth it, wasn't it? Now, this isn't the worst thing that the trailer does, but it's still disrespectful. You can have obfuscating openings to trailers, which have an element of surprise, that has the reveal lingering, we've seen plenty of those in years past. You can also have mystifying trailers that don't betray the project you're actually working on, that don't treat your actual project as secondary by playing off of the public's nostalgia for something fucking else. People are massively excited by what they know as Silent Hill 2. On paper, Silent Hill 2 is enough to get excited about. So Bloober start their trailer, the world's first glimpse of their treatment of Silent Hill 2 with callback to PT. How dare you disrespect Silent Hill 2 like that? Silent Hill 2 is so much more important than fucking PT ever was. With all due respect, fuck PT. And yes, this is quite obviously a PT reference, so I'm not getting this wrong. Look, I don't give a shit if it was really popular eight fucking years ago. I don't. I don't hate PT. It's not what I would have wanted from a Silent Hill game, so I was always sceptical of the impact that that demo would go on to have with people's expectations of the eventual Silent Hills. But either way, I don't want PT anywhere near Silent Hill 2, and fuck you for doing it. I mean, imagine. Th this is what this is like. Imagine if they started the very first reveal trailer of the Resident Evil 4 remake, with a camera slowly panning over what seems to be like a, a vanity cabinet dresser, something that could be in the castle, and there's a a hat that looks very similar to Lady Domitresque's for no fucking reason other than to get people giddy on fucking Twitter. Because fuck people being excited about Resident Evil 4, let's keep them in suspense. Let's get everyone talking about Village again at a really fucking inappropriate time. Right, okay. The best part is that I can't work out whether this was Bloober Team adding this in for a fucking Mick Foley cheap pop, much to Konami's chagrin. You know, given their relationship with PT and the bitter memories of Kojima that PT no doubt stirs up in them. Or if it was in fact Konami suggesting that they do this because they're well aware of how popular PT was, despite how they themselves subsequently treated it and the people that worked on it. I can't decide which reality is worse, but neither are as bad as the stench of simply inserting PT into the world of Silent Hill 2, regardless of the reason because it doesn't fucking belong there. Now, if you're going to accuse me of being pedantic, 
if you're going to try and tell me that this is a non-issue, let me remind you of something. This series, this game in particular, has a major historical problem with assets, shall we say, reappearing where they do not belong. Do these people know anything about this community and the issues that they've had with Konami's treatment of Silent Hill 2's world? It seems though they haven't read the room. I'll briefly explain the significance of this for anyone that doesn't know. This is Pyramid Head. He is an antagonist in Silent Hill 2. He is also entirely manifested from James's imagination. James Sunderland, the main character of Silent Hill 2, invents this character as an external tormentor. He cannot physically appear in any other Silent Hill media that does not involve James, which is pretty much all of it. So Konami, not understanding the projects that their own staff create and just seeing money signs, decided that because of Pyramid Head's design, that he was a marketable character, and they ran roughshod all over this pretty important little detail that he was entirely in James's head. And they had him appear in the Silent Hill film, in Silent Hill Homecoming, and a bunch of other shit where he cannot physically exist. Because these other characters have no fucking clue who or what this is, and he isn't real outside of James Sunderland. Now, I know that a cockroach is a much more generic entity than Pyramid Head is, but these cockroaches are present here because of PT, which has nothing to do with Silent Hill 2, and whilst they may only appear in this trailer and not be present in the final game itself, this is still the exact same shit we've been complaining about for years. Shit appearing where it doesn't belong, negatively impacting upon Silent Hill 2. A game where the entire premise is based on significance. Where every enemy design, where the random items you are finding, are eventually revealed to be incredibly visually significant to the characters. This is the exact same shit. We are one second in. One second. Bloob team have somehow managed to regurgitate the same kind of drizzling shits treatment Konami have been given Silent Hill 2, with their perceived marketability of Pyramid Head, shoving him into Silent Hill media where he cannot physically belong, by comparatively throwing a PT cockroach reference on screen. They fucked up in the first second of this trailer. So again, if you don't think that this is a big issue, go back to what the Silent Hill 2 community have been dealing with for years. It's not a good sign. We are striving not to miss the point. There are nine red flags that I want to discuss in this video. Three of them are majors. This first one is one of the smaller ones. We're off to a good fucking start, aren't we? Red flag number two. Major red flag number one. Telegraphing an unreliable narrator. We need to talk about the original game's premise and the setup of the original game's intro scene. In Silent Hill 2, the very first thing that we see is James looking in the mirror. No opening credits. He has a placid expression on his face. The scene is dreamlike, much like a lot of the scenes and dialogue we will witness from the rest of the game, taking their cue from David Lynch, amongst other influences. He pours at himself, almost wondering whether or not he, or indeed this place, is real because of the strangeness of the request that has brought him here. Nothing about this town is ordinary, as we, as players, likely already know because of the first game. We're expecting monsters and darkness, and this guy is going to have a rough time. At the very most, he stretches and sighs and resolves to leave the bathroom and venture into town. After this silent sequence that introduces us to this man, James, or rather, this man's sense of self, we then receive the premise, as narrated by James himself, once he leaves the bathroom. We find out that nothing about this exact scenario is ordinary. James has received a letter from his wife, three years dead, requesting that he comes to meet her in Silent Hill, a place that they had visited previously while she was alive. The request is what's strange about this whole setup. Not James himself. The letter deflects from James. His remarks suggest that he can't quite believe it either, and yet there it is, the letter in his hand. We all know at this point that this is a horror game from our experiences of the first Silent Hill, which is crucial. Silent Hill 2 very much plays off of, and works because of, our expectations of playing as a nice, normal man like we did in the first game, the typical protagonist. It is downright imperative that our expectations as players are that we're about to encounter a bunch of spooky shit because that's what Silent Hill does. Something's about to go really wrong for this poor man, and apparently he has already suffered enough in life before the game has even begun. We sympathise with James. We expect horror from without. All of this is downright integral to the revelations that subsequently unfold throughout the story. 
Compare this to the scene from the remake. We see James swivel into the bathroom and immediately the kinetic energy of the intro to this game is the polar opposite of what it is in the real Silent Hill 2. James is frantic, sweating, panting, checking his hands, he looks depressed, he's peering into the mirror with an expression of guilt. This game has immediately telegraphed the fact that James is an unreliable narrator sunken into a deep depression, rather than being the guilt-free, calm but inquisitive person that he is originally. Let me be succinct. You need to present this story in the exact same way in which it was presented originally. It doesn't fucking work if you don't. The entire premise, the twists, the revelations, none of those work. I know that we are all very familiar with the storyline of Silent Hill 2 in 2023, but you should be presenting this story for people who have never played the game before. You should be presenting it as if nobody has ever played it before. You should be treating me like I don't know what the fuck is going on. I would happily go along with Silent Hill 2 story all over again and pretend like I don't know. Like I would when living out anything else I've ever rewatched or replayed. This is a massive red flag that betrays the handling of the game's premise, that James is in a fugue state, in denial of having euthanized his wife a few days earlier, and that he has been dragged to Silent Hill, which is a town with a malevolent presence which feeds off of guilty people such as James, and the paper on which the letter has been written is fucking blank. Either way, nothing about this game so far is being presented correctly. In the original, James does not reconcile and remember what he has done until the end of the game. He's in a fugue state. His mind is blank, his memory willfully erased. The town of Silent Hill teases this out of him over the course of several hours of gameplay and storyline. So a few more seconds into this trailer and you have completely fucked up the plot delivery. Then later on we have this new scene. Okay so for context this room is a crazy puzzle room where you have to solve a riddle and work out which one of the six men hanged was innocent. The original shows James with a weird, dead expression on his face as he pulls a noose. Part graphical limitations of the time but also absolutely true to who James is at this point in the story. A living zombie with a hole for a head. This is not James contemplating suicide, this is the town of Silent Hill implying to him that he should commit suicide because that's the town's joie de vivre to punish the people it entraps. James didn't set this room up with these hanged men, I mean hell it doesn't physically exist. The town set this up. Yet here we have James looking like he should end things, like the feelings coming from within. If we look at this sequence of events in order from the original game. Early in the game, James takes a knife away from Angela as she contemplates suicide. James is resolute about saving Angela from suicide, because he's such a man and all, and reminds her that she still has the knife before she leaves, so he can take it away from her. Suicide is not an answer to James. Much later on, James pulls this noose with a dead expression. He isn't genuinely contemplating suicide, though his mind is in a weird blank space and Silent Hill itself is trying to give him intrusive thoughts. The town is taunting him. Now you might argue that the new scene is just showing those intrusive thoughts, but we're not to be shown so overtly that the attempt has worked. Any reaction to this should be realised by the player, not James. James should remain blank. Later, James confronts Angela for the final time, remains defiant about not committing suicide, though this is likely bravado, or the last grasp of James's ever-present ego more than anything at this point. James is an entirely self-absorbed man, that's what this entire storyline is about, and this is at a point in the story where he has actually found out the truth and he is still refusing to punish himself for it. In the remake, we see James looking at the noose like he deserves punishment long before the final revelation has been made, before he even understands what he has done. These are two different people, but you know, we're striving not to miss the point. Red Flag 3 stylized unrealism. I'm going to be somewhat terse here. The stylization of the character models makes these people look less real than they did in 2001. Silent Hill 2 was a far-fetched story, but the one thing that grounded it was that for 2001, hell even by today's standards, these people have been styled realistically. That's why it works so well. That's why it resonates. That's why Maria is so frightening. A hellish, far-fetched story is being propped up by very human, very everyday looking characters. These are not the usual hyper attractive fodder that we get in video games, they just look like normal people. The CG scenes are where the heart of this game really lies. Obviously these graphics are dated now in 2023, the skin texture is somewhat plastic, the hair isn't overly detailed, facial animation technology was limited and arduous to implement, but 
In terms of capturing a visage of realistic proportions, why does this guy look more normal than this guy does? This new model is a caricature. It's too stylized to humanize the story the way that the original did. This dude looks like a cartoon. Look at this scene with Maria from the original game. This man is responsible for these scenes, and this man is the genius of Team Silent. He's the most important man on Team Silent as far as I'm concerned, because the human touches that he added to the game's CG cutscenes were what drove the story deeper. I mean, my god, this man was ahead of the curve in terms of understanding lighting in video games. This scene is from 2001. It's on the PlayStation 2 for fuck's sake. Silent Hill 2's crazy story only works because of the grounding of the humanism in it, and we get that through these CG character models. This new caricature style that they've gone for, it's not driving home the grit of the story. But you know, we're striving not to miss the point. Red Flag 4, Tone Deaf. The tone of the game is completely wrong. It's melodramatic and over the top, rather than ambient and otherworldly. I'm ready. dreamlike. Leaving the bathroom, I'm sure that the developers feel they've done a great job of capturing the original location. I'm sure that many watching this trailer think that this is such a good graphical upgrade and it looks realistic and fantastic. Wow, what a remake, Mark. It's not supposed to fucking look like this. Immediately, I see strong wind and weather effects blowing leaves and debris. You can argue that the original game is rather static looking owing only to the technical limitations of the time, and that will partly be true, but the truth is that the original game's intro and the rest of Silent Hill 2 is supposed to be completely dead. The only things that move are James and the slight drift of the miasma. That's the fog. Everything else on your walk into town needs to be completely still until you meet a character or see a strange figure merging with the fog. This town is another world. This has always been the case. Even the crappy films understood this. So when I see blustering branches and strong winds that would blow the fog the fuck away, I know that these people don't understand the tone of the game they are supposedly so enamored with. This place is death. The performance of all of this is hammy and melodramatic, whether we're talking about the CG animations or the voice acting. Like, no offence to the voice actor, you're just doing a job that I'm pretty sure you're, that you're, you're happy to have, but this isn't the correct performance. Guy see he was James. The remix voice acting has James sounding like some gravelly Cormac McCarthy character instead of an emotionally impotent everyman. He sounds less like James Sunderland and more like someone who's been hanging around with Judge Holden. James Sunderland needs to sound pedestrian as fuck, which in the original he does. He sounds like a normal person you'd meet any day. I don't know whether this guy is channeling post Joel Miller as the vision because it's the style of the time, but it's completely off piste. Listen to this. Could she really be here? Waiting for me? Mary died of that damn disease three years ago. I'm ready. Now, remembering how much of a pathetic creature James is, listen to this. James! Mary? Oh, Maria. It's you. I thought you were... Sorry. Anyway, I'm glad you're alive. Anyway? What do you mean, anyway? <laughs> That's what I thought. James, give me back that knife. No, I, I won't. Saving it for yourself? Me? N no, I never kill myself. That is the definitive performance of James Sunderland. 
nailed the first time and Troy Baker couldn't hack this role all those years back. Most people probably don't even recall that Troy Baker voiced James Sunderland in the HD collection re-release from 2012, which included redubbed versions of Silent Hill 2 and 3. Fortunately Silent Hill 2's remastering included the original audio tracks and anyone with sense used the included original voice acting option for Silent Hill 2 sadly not present for Silent Hill 3. Whilst I would absolutely turn down the opportunity to direct a remake of Silent Hill 2 personally, if I had a gun pressed to my head and was forced to direct it, I've long said that all of the original audio must remain intact for a remake of Silent Hill 2. You cannot replace it. Any remake of Silent Hill 2 really should have just been a graphical glow up. And let's be honest, we've kind of had that on PC already. If you're going to remake it, You'd modernise the controls, the UI, and the graphics, and that's it. The plotline, voice acting, dialogue, music, audio cues, cutscenes, performances, they should all be pulled directly from the source. No new additions, be they scenes, dialogue, areas or enemies. Now, I am all for the uptick in emotionality in the stories of modern games. We've all seen these single player campaigns gradually become far more wrenching over the years and that's a good thing. Joel, get up. Joel, fucking get up! Dear Esther, I have burnt my belongings, my books, this death certificate. Mine will be written all across this island. Who was Jacobson? Who remembers him? Donnelly has written of him, but who was Donnelly? Who remembers him? One day the gulls will return and nest in our bones and our history. I will look to my left and see Esther Donnelly flying beside me. I will look to my right and see Paul Jacobson flying beside me. They will leave white lines carved into the air to reach the mainland, where help will be sent. Except Silent Hill 2, up until the final revelation and the reading of Mary's letter at the end of the game, which is the only display of genuine human emotion in the game because it's read out of context delivered by Mary essentially whilst she was alive. Emotions in the majority of Silent Hill 2 are weird. They don't read correctly. James doesn't show much emotion over Mary throughout the game because he's absolved himself of any guilt and essentially fridged her as his dead wife. Look at his relationship with Maria. He doesn't really give a shit about her. Maria is a manifest station brought forth by the town. She looks identical to Mary, except she's dressed more provocatively. She's more of a wildfire than Mary is. She's more sensual, representing James's sexual frustration. Being self-centered, he shows little concern for this newfound charge. He only considers finding his dead wife. The elevator scene shortly after this is, again, the town just starting to play with James after he reveals his apathy towards Maria. His remorse in the elevator sounds hollow. He doesn't dwell on her death at all. The town brings her eerily back to life for what is, in my opinion, the crystallisation of the game's essence in a singular scene and the best part of the game, where Silent Hill promptly nudges James in the ribs again about his relative apathy towards the women around him dying and what that's all about. So, while we only see a brief shot of this emotion in the new elevator scene, I can't help but dread to think how this scene will eventually read once all is said and done and given the way that everything else is currently heading. Are they going to end up presenting James feeling more emotion towards Maria's death than he actually should on the basis of the premise? Ultimately, this town should be swallowed by a dead stillness and we are being given a blustery town full of motion and what should be an unassuming, pathetic sounding, listless everyman now sounds heavy, burdened, grave and like he's due for a reckoning, which is the voice acting equivalent of showing everything that happens in the film in the trailer, but you know, striving not to miss the point. Red Flag 5 Nine Inch Nails. Oh great, the music's going to sound like every post Resna and Ross police procedural or documentary ever shown on Netflix. As soon as I read that Yamaoka was planning to redo the music, I think I flipped the table in front of me, by which point it had already made several rotations. Never mind this game. I already had a problem with a lot of music these days basically ripping off Nine Inch Nails, and the soundtrack scoring work that Trent Resna and Atticus Ross have added to many films and documentaries by this point, because it's pathetically unoriginal and it's fucking 
fucking everywhere. Every fucking thriller, every documentary sounds like this. I'm sure that the two found it very flattering initially, but at this point I wouldn't be surprised if Reznor and Ross decided to completely change their sound to get the fuck away from everybody else that's copying it. So I already had a problem with this before Silent Hill 2 Remake started to sound this way. To make things worse, the game that originally had arguably the greatest video game soundtrack of all time, entirely unique unto itself, sounding like nothing else is going to be remade to sound like everything else. Fan fucking tastic. I'm aware that Yamaoka isn't responsible for the creation of many of the actual sample sounds used originally, and I've seen many people mourn a hero's death when they found this out themselves. He took these samples from notable, expansive sound libraries that were kicking around at the turn of the century and stitched them together. But it was the way that he chose to arrange certain sounds together that gave Silent Hill its sound. This is what the original game sounds like, and I personally prefer the more obscure tracks to the more obvious ones that made the cut to the official soundtrack release. This is what the new game sounds like, apparently. If we go back to the noise stabs that are playing in the background of the Maria Jail scene and listen to this unsettling score underpinning the dialogue... Don't you want to touch me? I... don't know. Come and get me. I can't do anything through these bars. I can already tell that this kind of sensibility is probably just flat out dead in 2023, unfortunately. Is Yamaoka even handling the sound design? Have Blue Team tasked their own musicians with co-writing the score? The original game had a unique score to emphasise how unique the game itself was because Silent Hill is a pretty fucking unique place and this is such a unique fucking story. So let's have it sound like everything else these fucking days. But you know, we're striving not to miss the point. Red Flag 6. All the subtlety of a sneeze. 
The original game is full of subtle design, it's one of the greatest aspects of the original game because of how fucking sneaky it all was. The game is rife with symbolism throughout, enemy designs represent elements of Mary's bedridden terminal illness, or James's pent up sexual frustration during those long hospital visits, you go to pick up the game's all important flashlight from a mannequin that is wearing Mary's fucking outfit, that only the most eagle eyed people would have caught from the photograph in his inventory. The abstract daddy enemy, if you look close enough, represents two figures on a bed, one pinning down the other, playing awfully into Angela's horrific backstory. The charming piston action that can be seen in whatever the fuck these holes are, in the wall of this same room where Angela is being tortured by Silent Hill. There are countless examples of this throughout the entire experience, some of it more explicit than the rest, but the game beats you over the head with none of it. It's up to you to see it. It does not telegraph any of this information. They just slid it all in there to see how it affected you subconsciously. So with that said, this bloody handkerchief that James picks up here, which isn't in the original game, in this new scene is the kind of poorly written overt referencing to Mary's illness that shows that this game will have no fucking nuance whatsoever. The premise of this game demands nuance and subtlety throughout, but you know. We're striving not to miss the point. Red flag 7. Major red flag 2. We spoke earlier about Pyramid Head's marketability as a character and how he has been exploited in this franchise to the extent that he has. To date, showing up in more places that he does not, cannot physically belong than those where he can. Well, responsible for the creation of said character is Masahiro Ito, who if you followed him, has previously gone on record ruining any involvement in the creation of the character because of how it became such a sellout attraction that betrayed its original significance. So I'm really glad that, along with Yamaoka, he completes the two people that Konami brought back to ruin their original work. We need to talk about Pyramid Head, how he was presented, and how he works. Now, original. <laughs> Did you get that? Does that strike you as different? Did it catch you off guard? Well, I wish that more people would- <laughs> That is how the original game presents Pyramid Head to you. A short, sharp, full frontal blast of sexually dominating violence that flashes on screen without warning, for a second or so, before being pulled back again, before you have a chance to register what the fuck you are even looking at. That is really the first thing that anyone playing this game should see of Pyramid Head. When you finally get a good look at him, that is. If it was up to me, I probably wouldn't have included Pyramid Head in this new trailer, even though he is in the E3 2001 trailer for the original game. Back then, he didn't have the significance. Now, because of his significance, personally, I probably would have kept him under wraps until people actually played the game. Ultimately, they are showing pyramid head off in a way that should not be happening before the game is released. Which is a recurring theme that we will revisit for the last major red flag. This trailer shows that Bloober Team either do not understand blocking, or rather how it should be applied in this case. Here we see James, like a safety blanket, a comfortable familiar sight taking up much of the foreground, whilst we see Pyramid Head performing the same scene safely, off in the distance, in the background, out of focus. There's no assault on the senses with this scene. Let's go over the introduction to Pyramid Head in the original game. The initial prolonged shot is fine because you can't see him properly and don't know what it even is at this point. You're not sure how significant it is. You've seen a lot of weird shit by this point and have managed to deal with it okay so far. Then you enter a door and the first thing you see is the sudden visual assault in the Blue Creek Apartments followed by the Blue Velvet reference scene with James in the wardrobe closet. We do see an extended shot of Pyramid Head in the aftermath but it's dark and viewed through the slats of the wardrobe door. None of it is normal, you're still confused. Then not too long after that there's the sudden visual assault in the Blue Creek Apartments fire exit where you are locked in with Pyramid Head. You get a better look at him here but it's still off screen for half of the fight due to the tight camera and small room. You're too busy trying to get away from him. But the way in which you were reintroduced to Pyramid Head was certainly shocking. Then there's the sudden assault on the hospital roof where he just comes out of nowhere which I believe is what this scene is meant to be from. When I watched the reveal event initially I was confused by this. He looks like he's coming in off the street from the rain. Is he wandering into Neely's for a pint or something? What the fuck is this? The more I thought about it, this seems like he's walking into the stairwell on the hospital roof, but I, I could be wrong. Then there's the sudden appearance and chase in the hospital basement. Pyramid Head just shows up unexpectedly and instantly and you start having a very bad day. Now, I'm, I'm going to add a disclaimer here. Perhaps the initial second of this shot just isn't in the trailer. 
because it's a trailer and it's being saved for the main game. I have considered that. But then why would they show the scene right after that? Because they are giving it away. Pyramid Head, like I said, is included in the original game's E3 2001 trailer, but it's so fast you wouldn't think it was significant, so nothing's really spoiled. And we didn't understand the significance of Pyramid Head at the time. But now we're getting a safe shot that removes all of the what the fuck did I just see of the reveal of Pyramid Head due to the god-awful blocking? Either that or we're getting prolonged scenes where we get a good look at him for several seconds because why keep him a mystery before the game's even out? But you know, we're striving not to miss the point. Red Flag 8 arose on the waters. Okay, so of all of the red flags I'd say that this is possibly the tamest partly because I'd need to see more to verify it, but if my suspicions are correct, it's pretty fucking bad anyway, and it goes to show that they don't understand the first meeting with Maria at all. So, at a certain point in Silent Hill 2, we have to get from the east side of town to the west, but because this is fucking crazy land, the roads have been cut off and fall into endless pits that cannot be crossed. One side of town is locked off from the other, because Silent Hill is manipulating James to go to a certain place. So the one route that you can take is to go through Rosewater Park. Loop through and you'll come out on the other side of town. When you do this for the first time, you meet Maria. Maria should be met on the lakeside as she was originally. This is very important because she's as close to the water's edge as possible, looking out in the direction of the Lakeview Hotel like a giant neon arrow. The hotel, where James and Mary once stayed, and thus is the ground zero for their connection to the town, is where James travels to in the end game to be confronted by the truth. It's foreshadowing. At the end of the remake's trailer, we are shown James's meeting Maria in the gazebo instead. The gazebo is located in Rosewater Park, behind the water's edge of the lakeside. So, I need to discern whether the gazebo is in fact still in the same place before I could really say that this is critical. Is it in Rosewater Park, up the steps, and a good 20-30 metres back from the water's edge? Is she just looking out into the fog in any old fucking direction? Now this is a supposition, but I swear, if she's now technically looking south back into the town or something, I will fucking lose my shit. Well, I would if I even give a crap about this game, but you know what I mean. Well, she still could be looking north in the direction of the hotel. Moving her from the water's edge shows the lack of understanding for symbolism. It seems obvious to me that meeting her was moved to the gazebo for the sake of a more visual setting, showing a lack of understanding of the original context. Now, I'll let this one go if the gazebo has been moved from Rosewater Park and is now on a jetty onto Luca Lake and therefore represents the farthest reaching point towards the hotel. I can't tell looking at the shot whether this is fog or water. If, if they've extended the gazebo out onto the water to look towards the hotel, it's okay. This is probably not the case, however, and I'm well aware that I'm the kind of person who would be considerate enough to invent this possibility because I understand this shit better than they do, evidently. Still, there's a very real possibility that they have moved Maria from the water's edge and have her now looking fucking anyway. But, you know, we are striving not to miss the point. And with that, it brings us to the end. Red flag, nine. Major red flag, three. And did you forget we had one left? How to ruin a game completely. This is arguably the worst fucking sin in the entire trailer. It's certainly battling it out with red flag, two. Do you see the problem? This stupid trailer has millions of views. The PlayStation channel upload is depressingly the first thing that comes up when I simply enter Silent Hill 2 into YouTube search bar. I don't know if that's the same for everyone, but that thing needs fucking deleting if it's getting in the way of footage of the original game. This problem, however, extends beyond this trailer. This image has been up on every major digital store and used in advertising of the game the world over. It's on Steam. It's on PSN, it's on advert banners on websites, it's in article headline links, it will be on billboards and in print, wherever still does that these days. They put Mary in the fucking key art of the game. Mary, like Pyramid Head, is shown in the E3 2001 trailer for Silent Hill 2, which of course came out before the game did. But again, it's the kind of fleeting introduction that the average player wouldn't remember, it certainly isn't explained away in any explicit detail, and back in 
2001, trailers were not plastered all over the internet and easily accessible, which is why Brandon Jones came up with the idea for game trailers. Silent Hill 2 does not show you much of Mary at all for an absolutely critical reason. The original game does not beat you over the head with what Mary looks like because Mary is supposed to be a fucking afterthought. This is a man that enters into a state of amnesiac denial about having murdered his wife a few days earlier. You have a photo of Mary in your inventory in the game that you would probably have looked at for five seconds at the most and then moved on, if you weren't a weirdo. The game subtly hints at Mary's visage, i.e. via the mannequin dress in Blue Creek Apartments, and her condition in the enemies that you deal with. Ultimately, however, the game wants you to meet and become familiar with Maria instead, and the town of Silent Hill spends the entire fucking game asking James one question. Aren't you forgetting something? The meeting scene with Maria makes more direct references to Mary's visage, where James makes very surface-level observations about how Maria is Mary's double. <coughs> replacement. Because that's what she's meant to be, the new thing that comes along and distracts James. It is therefore detrimental to the presentation of the game's story to have everybody become incredibly used to Mary's visage long before playing the game before we have ever fucking seen Maria. Mary is supposed to be fucking gone. To the extent that when you do see this mannequin wearing Mary's clothes, the point is that you perhaps don't notice the connection rather than that you do. Most of us didn't. The developers were playing us, and it worked. If we look at the Steam Store page, we see this. Look, again, presenting this game as if it was a brand new experience for everyone, including the people that have played it originally, why the fuck are you even telling people about Maria? By all means include her in the trailer as a simple figure, a silhouette, with no explanation as to who she is. But I don't care if I know the plot. Don't fucking give it away on the storefront. This part here? Leave it at that. I knew. I knew as soon as I saw Mary in the key art that they didn't have a clue how to tell this story. I know it's 2023, but you still need to pull back the reins and not give much away. Except the basic premise. James bumping into his dead wife's doppelganger and getting used to her hanging around and us not having Mary's visage waved in front of us before we've really gotten going is supposed to be how the story unfolds. If anything, instead of thinking, I know exactly what Mary looks like from the offset and then bumping into Maria and being like, oh, she's a palette swap for Mary. We're supposed to hear James say, you look exactly like my wife and then take his word for it even though we have the fucking photograph. You're supposed to look at that photo and forget it's throwaway. That's the point that the story's making, and then here's the distraction that makes you forget all about her. Otherwise you are completely undermining what Silent Hill, the town itself, is trying to achieve. What the story is trying to achieve. Bloober team do not understand the fucking amnesiac fridging element of a fucking amnesiac fridging story. Let's just slap Mary into the key art for everyone to get really fucking used to for over a year of radio silence and simply show Maria's silhouette in the trailer, but then give away exactly who Maria is in the storefront description so everyone new to the story can smell it coming a mile away. But you know, we are striving not to miss the point. These people do not know what the fuck they are doing. Yesterday, I read that Eurogamer article where Bloober Team have stated that they are done with psychological horror, instead favouring mainstream horror now. While they are developing Silent Hill 2 Remake, they say that they're done with psychological horror. <laughs> they say they want to make mainstream games. Evidently, they only give a fuck about selling through on their remake of Silent Hill 2, earning all of the accolades for a smash success and don't even give a fuck that anybody new to the story might want to experience its surprises for the first time. Then we get this at the bottom of the Steam listing. You fucking what? Your game is not a masterclass in psychological survival horror lauded as the best in the series. How the fuck are you claiming the accolades that were attributed to the original game? Do not give these people any fucking money. Oh, Tim, goddammit.